HIFEC, the Haifa Forum for Interfaith Cooperation, um, was an extension of our own uh, approach to uh, meetings with others and with people of various traditions and faiths, and we wanted to make a public voice heard. Uh, and we want, we, it was clear to us that we needed to educate people that meeting others and interacting and living in friendship does not threaten one's own religious identity, but actually strengthens it. And by the fact that we can come across um, our religious divides and connect as human beings enriches all of our lives. And that is the uh, uh, mandate for HIFEC, for the Haifa Forum for Interfaith Cooperation uh, here in Haifa, to reach out and to show an example of religious leaders uh, living together harmoniously and doing our educational mission, which is to fill what otherwise would be filled by fear, uh, and to fill it with interest, to fill it with a sense of enriching our lives as human beings by meeting others from different religions and faiths. Within Judaism, there's a variety of approaches, just like any other religious uh, or faith-based community. Uh, and especially today, I think in the world, we are facing a challenge, uh, a very serious challenge from within each one of our faith traditions. This is true in Judaism, it's true in Christianity, and it's true in Islam. Radicalism and fundamentalism are strengthening their power in the world. And it's an interesting phenomena, and this is true also about Judaism. We have the elements of extreme uh, right-wing positions. We have a closing off of um, our sense of being able to uh, and act freely and interact with various traditions, and we see that uh, throughout Israel. Uh, and this is true as in Judaism, I think, as in other traditions and faiths, uh, Islam and Christianity as well. Um, we have that variety within Judaism. There are many different ways uh, of, um, of being Jewish here in Israel and specifically here in Haifa. We have Orthodox communities, we have ultra-Orthodox communities, we have liberal Jewish communities, and we have secular Jewish communities. Uh, Haifa is a truly diverse city, uh, and one of its unique elements is the interaction between the different groups. Um, we have in Judaism, just like in any other religion, the fundamentalists' approach uh, and the extremists who will say that only Jews should have the right to be full citizens here in Israel. Uh, and we have the democratic, the liberal, uh, pluralistic Jewish approach who say all citizens of Israel should be equal. In Haifa, we have a reality where the liberal approach is the one that is, I, I feel, stronger throughout the entire city. We have it on a sociological uh, level. We have Jews, uh, Arabs, both Christians and Muslims, interacting freely. Here in our building is a good example of that. In the malls, in the streets, um, we still have a, a lot of work to do in Haifa to make it uh, a truly uh, a place of equality uh, for all. But we also have um, have made incredible steps forward uh, in the way people interact with each other and how they feel comfortable uh, with both Jews, uh, Christians, Arabs, Muslims, Baha'is living together in the city. Um, the approach that we took in Haifek was to invite everyone. Uh, today, within Haifek, we have uh, the representatives of liberal Judaism, both conservative and reform. We have um, representatives of secular Jewish communities. Uh, and we're still hoping that one day also the Orthodox communities will join us. The holiday of holidays is a wonderful concept. It brings together uh, celebration, which is a core of human existence. Um, I think from within the Jewish world, uh, the people who are not afraid and people who are strong within their own identity feel that they can share their own celebrations with others without feeling uh, challenged by it or without feeling that it's, it's actually uh, an assault on them from a different religion. And to be able to celebrate together is a, uh, an element that I think is, is clearly felt within the holiday of holidays. What we're trying to do and what Haifek brings to the, uh, to the holiday of holidays is a, an attempt to go deeper, 
to not only leave it on uh, a, um, a sociological level or a level of, uh, um, of being in each other's presence, but also understanding where the differences lie. Um, and I think this is something that we bring as a model from within our own uh, individual lives into HIFEC, that talking about what we have in common is wonderful, and it sets a ground on which everyone can interact. But exploring our differences is where it becomes much more interesting. Uh, in the holiday of holidays, uh, under the, uh, uh, the guidance of uh, um, Asaf Ron from uh, Beta Geffen, uh, we are trying to bring in more opportunities to go deeper into listening to each other. And that's why this uh, um, holiday season we actually offered, as HIFEC, we offered uh, all the or uh, social change organizations throughout uh, the city uh, the opportunity to uh, experience communication uh, be better interpersonal communications through listening circles and in that way offer the, the, the place where we can hear each other's stories and start to go deeper. Within the Jewish population of Haifa, I think uh, on the level of, uh, of the phenomena of let's go and share and let's go and be in an Arab neighborhood, uh, there's a great openness to uh, that kind of experience. Um, it's more on, on the folklore level that we share the music and we share the food uh, and we can meet each other on that level. The holiday of holidays is not a religious holiday. It is a social structure, a cultural structure that was put in place uh, by the Haifa municipality uh, in order to bring together uh, during this uh, season of holidays uh, the various uh, people. And it doesn't have a religious uh, element to it. Uh, we don't do Hanukkah lighting together. Uh, we don't do Christmas trees together. Uh, I, I hope that one day we can go in this direction uh, and expose uh, the people to, this, uh, to these elements. And also, of course, in the uh, Muslim traditions, uh, except that there the, the dates vary because their uh, calendar is a lunar calendar, so it travels around the year, whereas the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar uh, that's also set by the sun. It's a, a combination of the two, so our holidays stay set uh, within the seasons. Um, so there isn't per se a religious contribution to the holiday of holidays. It is a holiday in the sense that we all celebrate around this time and we use it to come together and say and, and find our commonalities in this celebration. You're asking a question that goes to the core of the existence of Israel, not only Haifa. Um, but Israel is so dynamic that uh, we don't have to look very far to get a, an example of what you're asking. Uh, in the time of the Second Lebanon War, uh, there was really this kind of breakdown of infrastructure that uh, all the energy had to go in a different direction, uh, and we couldn't really put all our energy into the coexistence. That was a time where um, we actually could uh, test the coexistence. And the reality, just like the rest of Israel, is always complex. And there was a mix. In Haifa, uh, there were some extreme demonstrations uh, on both sides, the uh, um, Christian and Muslim Arab side, and on the Jewish side as well, the Jewish-Israeli side. Um, those demonstrations were uh, for and against um, this attack on Israel. So on the fringe, and we shouldn't be afraid to talk about the fringe, uh, we know from uh, human history, from our own uh, experience, that fringes have a way of really affecting what's going on in society. So those fringes do exist, and there were, um, on both sides, um, there were uh, demonstrations of course, some were supporting on the extreme side, supporting the attack on Israel, and others from the Jewish-Israeli side were saying, well, this is the time where we have to, we see reality and we have to get rid of all the Arabs in, in Haifa. Those were the extremes. In the middle ground was where most of the population in Haifa found themselves, where we were all dealing with a threat from outside. 
there was no discrimination. Uh, rockets hitting Haifa didn't discriminate between a Jewish home and an Arab home. Um, you know, explosions and, and the, the terrible attack on Israel uh, could not pinpoint uh, anyone except Israeli citizens. If they were Jews, if they were Muslims, if they were Christians, if they were Baha'i, we all were in it together. Most of the um, coexistence elements continued throughout that crisis. And in a way, that's an answer to your question. But I don't want to hide behind the war. I know that also in uh, the reality of Haifa today, we have a huge struggle in front of us. We have uh, a fight and um, we have to put our energies into it because on the one hand, Haifa is the place of most natural and normal interaction between the various uh, segments of the community in the entire country. There's no other city like it in Israel. On the other hand, we have a long way to go to truly make this a city of equality. There are many attempts to do that. There's a lot of work going into it. Uh, and there's also a whole educational system uh, that exists actually outside of Haifa, uh, Yad Biyad, where Jews and uh, Christians and Muslims, Arabs and Jews, send their children to joint schools. Um, this has not been a great success. It's still a, a very big challenge. Uh, even the joint education, which is a small segment of the population who are really willing and ready to send their children to a joint school where Hebrew and Arabic um, is divided equally. The time in studying in Hebrew and studying in Arabic is divided equally. Uh, where holidays are mentioned and celebrated and studied equally. Uh, this is not provided yet. Even that kind of educational system has not provided yet uh, the answer to true coexistence. Um, I think the word coexistence is part of the problem. Uh, the state of Israel was established uh, with a declaration of independence. Uh, and there clearly were stated two things. One, that there should be no difference between uh, groups of religion, faith, gender, uh, in citizenship. And the other is the idea that Israel was founded on the prophetic vision of the Jewish prophets. We learn from the prophets that they were tolerant of human beings and intolerant of immoral behavior, no matter if it came from within Judaism or was external to Judaism. Uh, the prophets knew how to um, admonish Jewish behavior that was immoral. Uh, and telling us, for instance, that coming to ritual, to Jewish ritual, and feeling that if we, we fulfill our ritual obligations, we have fulfilled our Jewish obligations without uh, doing our moral obligations. And they admonish the Jewish people consistently, saying this is not what Judaism is about. We don't need the sacrifices at the time at the temple. We need you to treat each other fairly in commerce, in social interactions in the judging, in the system of uh, courts and in judgment. That is what God demands of us. Uh, they didn't differentiate that behavior to Jews or to non-Jews. That is the prophetic vision that is at the heart of the establishment of the state of Israel. And we need to fulfill that goal in order to have a state which is uniquely Jewish but does not um, in any way connect citizenship with religion or faith-based community. Israel, there's no simple answer, and Haifa is a, an example of this. There are no simple ready-made solutions for the conflicts and the dynamics that go on today in Israel, especially in Haifa. Uh, in some ways, Israel is the over-promised land it has so much promise, it has so much potential, yet it brings together dynamics of conflict which can lead to 
um, an explosion. And always where there's great potential, there's great potential for goodness and there's great potential for evil. And we see that in the atomic world. We can use atomic energy to generate wonderful things in our life and in the world, or we could use it for a bomb. Israel is very much the same kind of concept. The potential here and the drawing together of such passion um, and commitment can either lead to what the Declaration of Independence, of Israel's Declaration of Independence says, that we will be a light onto the nations, or we could explode from all this pressure. I think conflict is unique in Israel, and I think in each city of conflict, there's a unique element to it. Specifically in Israel, we are not in the Middle West, we are in the Middle East. And sometimes we tend to forget that. We can't import Western thinking and think that it will work here. It needs to go through a conversion. Western ideas are wonderful, but if we are to interact with our surroundings, we need to transform these ideas and make them authentic to the general area and environment in which we live. Um, our neighbors, you know, for uh, many years now, have made different choices about how they relate to Israel. We, and all this boils down to what happens here in Haifa. This is not theory. In Haifa, this is practice. When we live side by side, we need to make the choices that enhance the potential of being a unique state, which is uniquely Jewish. And we know this from our history, and I think as a people, uh, striving, as a Jewish people, striving for their own independence, we have a right and an obligation to have a Jewish homeland. And yet at the same time, in order to be a Jewish homeland, it has to be a moral state on the standards, at least, of the prophets of Israel, which puts us with an immense challenge. How do we make this happen? How can we have a Jewish state that does not um, in any way infringe on the citizens' rights who are not Jewish? There are models for this. There are people in Israel who are working on this. Um, in Haifa, uh, I think one of the elements that's very strong here, here is that we're living it. We're not theoretically working on it. We're living it, uh, which is a hard way to learn lessons, but that's how we're doing. Uh, you are a specialist of conflicts. Uh, you have a specific suggestion for the Haifa case on conflict? My approach to conflict management, um, which is not conflict resolution, uh, I don't see that conflict at this level has a resolution, but it has a way of, um, I think, fueling positive potential, is based in my Jewish world. As a rabbi, as I said, uh, the way I interact with the world comes from my own faith tradition and from my own background. At the core of Judaism, there's no credo in Judaism. Uh, there's a discussion in the Talmud about what are the essences of Judaism, what is the most important element. Uh, and there's a suggestion there that there's 13 principles, and then another rabbi comes and says we can actually boil them down to seven. They don't agree on the seven. They say maybe we can agree on three. They don't agree on three. They come up with one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, Adonai is Echad, is one. How is this connected to conflict management? Many people will tend to discuss the end of that verse. What is Adonai, the name of God? I don't want to translate it as Lord, because Lord has a connotation that Adonai does not. Adonai is a broader concept of God than Lord. Uh, so many people will focus on the end of that verse, saying, what, what, what is Adonai? Does Adonai, does a God exist or doesn't a God exist? How do we know what God wants from us and so on? These are all very important questions. But it so happens, and maybe this is not by chance, that Judaism started from one commandment in this verse, Shema, hear, 
listen. I think at the core of Judaism is our ability to listen. And this is at the heart of conflict management here in Haifa. If we learn deep listening, and listening has various levels. You know, we have, uh, we sometimes try to not hear what others say. And sometimes we try to interpret what other people say according to our own understanding. But our ears cannot be shut. Compared to the eyes, which we can always close our eyelids, our ears, unless we put our hands to our ears, they are always open. I think that, for me, is at the core of Judaism. Hear, listen. Listen to the human being. Listen to the human need. Listen to the human story. We make meaning in the world by telling stories. That's our narrative. That is what history is, and that is how we create our own identities. What is our story? And our stories come from within, and they come from the surroundings by hearing, by listening. If we can really listen to the story of the other, we can start to connect on levels which go beyond our conflict. That is what needs to ha happen here in Haifa. We need to set up forums, and we have, and Haifek is working in this direction, to set up forums where people can hear each other. That's why listening circles are so important, and Haifek brought listening circles into the holiday of holidays. Here's an opportunity to sit and hear, and in this way fulfill the Jewish commandment of hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Listen. Listen to the other. Try and hear them deeply. And then together we can create solutions. Solutions can't be brought from the outside. They cannot be brought from the individual on another individual. They can come when people interact and hear each other deeply. And together there's always a way to find a better future. Um, but I, I will start from how representative uh, I am. Um, the ability to be deeply rooted in my own tradition and to have an uh, identity that is open to others from a sense of strength, uh, I think is not something that we find in many people. I think it's not a common phenomena anywhere in the world. Um, Israel in that way is not unique. There are unique voices here, and there are people who are working towards this, and people who deeply believe this, and you can find them in the Muslim, and the Christian, and the Jewish, and the Baha'i communities um, in Haifa. Uh, in terms of numbers, I think our ability to affect the society is stronger than the numbers we are in the population. Um, I also think that today, with extremism rising in all faith traditions and religions, the world is faced with that challenge. Um, it's ironic that in this day and age where freedom of choice prevails in a way that never before did humanity know this, a person can wake up in the morning and choose their nationality, choose their religion, go so far as choose their gender if they so wish. It's a golden age of choice. Yet we see that people are not satisfied, rewarded, or feel content in this world of free choice. More and more people are turning to defined answers that give a black and white option that give a yes-no reality. I do not live, and I think human nature, when it is full and flourishing, does not live in a black and white reality. Um, there are not many people who can hold on and be rewarded, satisfied, and feel committed to uh, a world in which there are no black and whites. There are diversity and spectrums that make life and human existence colorful and beautiful. Uh, in terms of numbers, I think we, we are small. Uh, there are two versions in the Talmud, in the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, relating to 
the idea of saving a, uh, a human life. And one version sta sta states uh, that kol hametzil nefesh achat mi Israel ki'ilu hetzil olam umlo'o, which freely translates to any who, anyone who saves a life um, from Israel, from the Jewish people, saves, it's as if he saved the entire world. The second version says, kol hametzil nefesh achat, Anyone who saves a soul, it's as if he saved the entire world. And the difference is a major difference. It just has two words in the quote. Is this a person from Israel, meaning the Jewish people, or is this humanity? Both ideas exist truly in Judaism. Judaism does not survive. When I hear the word survival, I hear something that's about to die and is hanging on. You might want to imagine a straw, that with that straw they're, they're already sinking, but the straw is out there and there's a little bit of air coming in to survive on, or someone clawing their way out. That's not Judaism. Judaism does not survive. Judaism lives, flourishes, exists. Those are words that entail a, a picture of life in its fullest, and we know that life, in biological terms, equals change. As long as we change, as long as we evolve, as long as we develop, we will live. When a different type of change comes in, which is the deterioration, the dying, when we stop evolving and changing, we start to die. Judaism has not died for thousands of years because it has a way of changing and evolving with time. That is what Judaism is. It's always looking back on our own tradition, on our own faith, on our own sources, and making meaning of reality in terms of what is happening here and now. And when Jews bring the here and now together with tradition, that is Judaism. And it's an ever-evolving entity, living entity. As such, we have a huge variety in our own tradition. And if you want to be an extreme fundamentalist Jew, you will find the sources in Judaism that will prove you right. And if you want to be a liberal, democratic, humanitarian Jew, you will find the sources in our own faith and our tradition that will prove you right. And that is another um, secret of Judaism. It says in the Torah, Uvacharta b'chaim, and you shall choose in life. Now some re read that as saying that you have a choice to do good or bad. I understand those two words as saying, in order to have life, you must continually choose. It starts with vav hachibur, the first letter, uvacharta b'chaim, the first letter vav, is the word and, but it's a perpetual and, ongoing, entirely committed to choice. That is how I understand those crucial words in the Torah. When you commit your life to being conscious, to being aware, to being observant, both in the sense of observing my Judaism, but observing what's going on, you reach a level of consciousness in which choice becomes what life is about. At every moment, I can decide how to live my life. And some people ask me, we spoke about this earlier, why do I wear a kippah? Some segments of Judaism will explain that kippah is a, um, a, uh, a tradition that is handed down and it's to remind you that God is always present. That's not my choice. My choice in wearing a kippah is to remind me physically, having something on my head, that at every moment in my life, I can choose how to relate to the person, to nature, to what is going on, the dynamic in society, because I have the ability to bring sanctity, kedusha, into that moment. And the way I choose to behave and to interact on the smallest and on the largest scale I can bring sanctity to the moment 
or refrain from bringing sanctity, block sanctity. When I choose from my tradition, and I am very honest about my tradition, with thousands of years of tradition, as Judaism has, you can find everything in it, everything. And I choose to make Judaism uh, a part of my life every moment, also by choosing how to interact and how to bring in sanctity, and also to choose the sources which say to me, kol hametzil nefesh achat ki'ilu hitzil olam umlo'o. Anyone who saves a soul saves the entire world. And the distinction, when do I need to put in Israel? It's when I'm afraid and when I'm not in control and when I feel that I'm um, threatened mo every moment of my life, an existential threat. Today in Israel, there is a threat. I don't want to be blind to it, but we have won the wars. Unfortunately, we've had to go to war. And I served in the army just like all uh, of my peers in Israel, and many still today serve in the army of the people. And I bring my kippah and my notion of sanctity also into my army service. How at every moment, even in a moment of conflict and death and threat, how can I bring in a sense of sanctity about what I'm doing? And so for me, I want to enhance those elements which bring strength to my Judaism and my existence as a Jew, and I don't need to differentiate. When I save a soul, it's a soul and it's the entire world, and it's irrelevant what faith, what tradition, what religion that soul is.